hello, everyone. I may repeat this uh, two or three times, but uh, yeah, please, uh, please throw some hellos in the chat if you can see and hear me and see and hear all of us. There is actually, don't know how many Zoom webinars everyone here has been to before, but um, there's going to be a little drop down next to it, like in your chat that says two and the default says two hosts and panelists. You're going to want to change that to to everyone because then everyone can see what you say. Uh, so switch that to everyone. Say hello. Awesome. Awesome. Hello, Lauren, uh, Javier, Allison, Desmond, Isra. I'm not catching everyone because there's so many people here. This is really cool. Yeah. Nicholas, Bianca. Hey, everyone. Um, so we are going to leave a couple more minutes for everyone to filter in. I will say, uh, while we wait to filter, I would love to see something else in the chat. I know a good number of you are already using Sketchy. So what I want to know is, um, if you are using Sketchy right now, what are you using Sketchy to prepare for? Uh, or really, just what are you preparing for at all, whether you're using Sketchy or not? You working for step one? MCAT, step two, ex, you know, exams, uh, whatever it is. Maybe some of we got some pharmacy or PA students out there. I don't even know. I, I, I know we got some sketchy folks there. Awesome. Step one seems to be certainly winning the popular vote by landslide, but real cool for, uh, yep, yeah, calling out just uh, course exams. Step two, a couple MCATs in there. Hello, MCAT. Um, uh, and that's really great. So, um, I think we're going to roll into, uh, so my name is Adam Gray. Uh, I am the head of medical and pre-medical education at Sketchy. Uh, and my job here today is hype man, strictly. Uh, I am going to give no more than five minutes of just a little bit of what we're doing today, what Sketchy is for those of you who um, are maybe wondering a bit. A um, little bit of stuff on Sketchy, but then I'm going to throw things over to Lauren and our wonderful panel of residents who I think you are seeing on all of these little windows right now. So uh, yeah, let's move on to our agenda here. <clears throat> uh, Lauren, can we move to the next slide? Is that working? There we go. Cool. So yeah, this is what we're doing today. You can see what the uh, pieces of our panel are going to be, and then we are going to have time for Q and A. Uh, so we're looking to finish up our formal panel section, maybe ten or fifteen minutes ahead of time. Um, and so, if you have questions of your own that you didn't submit beforehand, there was a submission beforehand, but if you didn't see that or you got questions in the meantime, just throw them right in the chat, um, uh, and uh, and we're going to answer them at the end. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about Sketchy. Probably a lot of you already know what Sketchy is, but for um, the handful of folks who are not quite as, maybe not quite as aware, we are a visual learning platform. We got a lot of people who have used us to help succeed on exams and become doctors and prep for other things. We've transformed the way that med school works, uh, especially for tough topics like micro and pharmacology. This is my dog. I thought she was going to stay on my lap, but this is the work from home life. Um, and yeah, it improves scores. People have a good time. If you're wondering if Sketchy is for you, uh, well, you know, this is what we do. You want to remember stuff quickly? You want to have fun? Probably, probably yes. Sketchy could work for you. It's kind of what we're getting at. If you like whales in space, that's what we do. And if you're wondering, but is Sketchy right for me for the things I am about to do? Uh, the answer might surprise you because I'm going to hand things over to Lauren in just a second, but I want everyone to be aware of what's brewing right now. Uh, we have expanded our preclinical content recently and continue to do so. So especially those of you who are about to start med school um, or are moving through kind of systems-based classes, we've moved into A&P, biochem, recently added some biostats and epidemiology. And if you're using Sketchy for step one and you're about to start your third year, I don't know if you've heard, but we're going to make Sketchy as big a deal for third year as it is right now for first and second year. Um, Lauren actually is the lead on all that. Uh, she's been working hard at it. Her team is making some really awesome stuff on all of what you need to succeed for your third year. Um, so 
keep that in mind. If you are an MCAT prep student or you know any MCAT prep students, we have an MCAT course um, and it covers high yield material for all of the sciences. I'm really proud of a lot of the work that's been done there. And then for Sketchy as a whole, people have asked us for flashcards forever. I want to say like it's been one of the top things people have wanted for Sketchy and they are on the way. It is not going to be very long. They're on the way. And I know there are a lot of folks who ask uh, in previous questions about like IMG, FMG. Um, and so especially for international users or if you just like other payment options, we recently added uh, 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 recently added new payment options. I meant to say PayPal, it says PayPay. Sorry about that. I need to proofread this slide, my bad. But PayPal and Apple Pay, um, we've added that recently. And yeah, flashcards. We're calling them Sketchy Flip right now. I don't know if we've quite trademarked it yet. Uh, but you know, because, you know, flashcards flip. Uh, and if you are interested in buying or renewing Sketchy, there's going to be a promo code uh, here at the end of the session. So you can keep that in your noggin. But with that, I want to hand things over to Lauren, who has all of the following things that are true about her. Um, she is our director of clinical here at Sketchy, um, an anest uh, anesthesiologist, uh, just has a wonderful list of awesome things she has done in her career up to and including this very residency panel. So I'm going to throw things over to Lauren for the rest of our time. Thank you all for my little five minute hype session. I hope this is enjoyable. Well, thank you so much, Adam. I am so thrilled to have you all here and have our panelists here as well. Um, my name is Lauren Fisher. I am a DO grad, PCOM, and a uh, practicing anesthesiologist. And I'm thrilled to have our panelists here as well. So we have Alessandra, Austin, and Lavina. Um, Alessandra, do you want to do just a quick intro, who you are, where you're from? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Alessandra Petrillo. I'm from New Jersey. I graduated medical school from St. George's University, so I am an IMG. I can answer any questions about that. And currently, right now, I am at Hackensack University Medical Center, um, soon to be starting um, fellowship in hematology oncology at Stony Brook University. Fantastic. And Austin, I know, is our, our multitasking surgeon of the moment. Austin, are you available to, yeah, here he goes. Yep. Hello, I'm Austin. I'm from Oregon, moved to Florida for uh, med school. I went to UCF from Orlando. I'm at now uh, Sarah, Pennsylvania, so a little northern Pennsylvania town. Today, program at Robert Packer Hospital. I'm multitasking and uh, out in a walk with my two-year-old, so after a busy ICU day, so I'm happy to be here. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. And lastly, we have Lavina, who is our star MS4, who just went through the match. Uh, so if you want to quickly introduce yourself, and she's going to tell, tell us all of her matching tips for a successful match. Hi, everyone. My name is Lavina Segel. Um, I am an MS4 at Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center in Lubbock, Texas. Um, I went through the match this year and matched in family medicine at MedStar Georgetown in Washington, D.C. So I'm really excited to get to chat with you guys today and talk a little bit about my journey. Fantastic. So thank you all. And the way that we've sort of formatted this in as far as a Q&A is that we asked for some questions submitted up front. And um, thank you to everyone who submitted questions. There were tons and tons of them. So I went through and kind of bunched them into different categories. So that way our panelists can kind of speak to individual um, concepts. And then after that, we'll have some opportunity to do some Q&A if you want to throw some extra questions in the chat that maybe we haven't addressed that are burning questions that you, you really just thought of and want answers to, we're happy to do those. So um, the first kind of bunch of questions, there were a ton about some tips for boards prep and oops, went too far. So um, I guess, we can throw it off to maybe Lavina. You might be the, the closest in touch to boards right now. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about your experience with boards prep, some resources you used? 
stuff like that. Well, first of all, um, I had a little bit of a non-traditional journey. I actually repeated my MS2 year. So lots of resources that I used and things that I learned along the way and not affiliated with sketchy, but literally sketchy micro and sketchy path, like saved my life and also sketchy farm. Um, in terms of studying for step one, I think it was really important to use UWorld. Um, UWorld being resource number one, the holy grail, um, the thing that you should be focusing on the most, and then filling in content gaps with Sketchy, with Anki, with Boards and Beyond. Choose a resource of your choice, um, but applying it as much as possible to UWorld. Um, I think for step two, the interesting kind of transition for me was that I did, I barely used UWorld for step two. Um, and I actually found the CME forms and the old NBMEs to be very, very helpful because I felt like UWorld was a little bit more complicated and a little bit more detailed than how the actual exam was. Um, I'm also a huge fan of divine intervention podcasts, if you're familiar with those. So I pretty much used um, sample NBMEs and Divine for step two. And also there's obviously a huge difference in how long you study. So I studied for step one over the course of a year and a half and step two, I studied for two weeks. So um, huge difference there. And for those of you going through step one right now, I really feel for you. It was a very rough time for me and probably the hardest thing I had to do in medical school versus step two, I felt like was a much more manageable, studyable exam building on the foundation that you get from rotations as well as your step one studying. Very cool. Oh, I appreciate all of those resources. And I know Alessandra, in addition to taking USMLE is currently prepping for her internal medicine boards as well. So any, anything to add in that respect? Sure. Yeah, I think um, when it comes to preparing for board exams, it's always important to go back to the basics of your medical foundation knowledge, which really comes from resources like Sketchy, like um, Boards and Beyond Online Med Ed. There are a number of um, resources out there you can use. And sometimes it could be overwhelming that there's so many um, to choose from, but really what you should be focused on is how to create an effective study plan. So for instance, um, starting off in a systems way, starting off with cardiology one week and respiratory the next week, and then going off of those resources and creating a comprehensive plan so that for that week you're doing cardiology, you're touching, um, you know, sketchy cardio, all of their sketchy um, pharmacology visit, um, videos that are related to cardiology, um, uh, you know, you're going through your online med ed for the cardiology and it starts to be very repetitive and you start remembering things better and then testing that knowledge with resources like UWorld or um, what um, the, you know, the CME exams that are out there. Um, specifically in prepper, you know, in preparing for step one versus two versus three, I, I didn't really see much of a difference other than step one is highly a lot of science background information. So really knowing um, all of your pathways is key, enzymes, proteins, that's going to be really important. Um, versus step two, you're looking at more of the clinical medicine. So you have to understand all of that step one um, information to do well in step two. And then step three is, um, you know, it's really a combination of, of everything, but less of step one. Um, internal medicine boards for anyone who's interested in going into IM is really just an extension of medical school um, and your medical foundational knowledge. So you're, you keep building on that knowledge throughout time. Um, so that's why I am utilizing Sketchy right now, because all of that information is very um, important to, um, you know, be able to treat your patients at the end of the day. Um, as far as advice going for uh, step one, now that it's going to be pass fail, I think that this impacts um, IMGs the most or FMGs the most because step one was our way of showing, um, you know, how um, competitive we were against um, all the other medical students uh, in our country. And so now that's been sort of taken away from us. I think, um, in, you know, to 
advice I would give would be to um, obviously devote your time to studying step one, but also find ways that you can stand out on your um, CV in, in other ways like research or um, like tutoring, um, you know, anything you can do in medical school that will make you stand out is, is really beneficial. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that pretty much sums it up. Yeah, and, and if I can kind of add to that, um, prior to my sketchy life, um, I also served as a um, uh, advisor, a student advisor in student affairs. And um, one thing that I always found with the med students who would come in and ask, you know, what should I get involved in? How can I build my CV? Is that they wanted to sign up for everything. And um, one piece of advice I would consistently give my students is to really narrow it down and find something that you want to go deep in rather than breath and maybe choose one thing in med school, you know, a club or something that you're really passionate about and go deep on it and choose one thing out of med school, whether it's you know, a sport or a social engagement or community involvement and go really deep in that as well. I think a mistake that people make is that they try to pile on so many things. And then when you start actually talking about it in the interview setting, it comes out that it's really not a terribly deep connection. And um, I think that that could actually hurt rather than help. Um, and Austin, I want to give you a chance to, to give any tips. Yeah, I would echo everything that was said. Um, I think it's a good value to, you know, find out these topics you're passionate about and to follow it. It really shows when you're, you're interviewing candidates and, you know, they're really passionate about something and can answer questions in depth rather than surface level. Also, there's a thing that I experienced early on um, about with too, too much board prep materials and resources. And so I just got lost in everything. I used uh, sketches and and then also just you world uh, kind of questions. Um, I think I think it's very important just to set set them away, um, make a study plan they can stick to, and just get that repetition of the questions down. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. I see that a lot with students where they try to just get all the resources, and um, I think that's a really valid point to kind of figure out what pattern and what style works for you, and then go go all in. Um, I just want to add something there if it's okay, because I think Austin made like a really, really great point as someone who like really struggled with step one and had to basically study for it twice. The resource overload thing is, is very real and it ultimately does not matter outside of you world, what you use to learn the material. It can be sketchy. It can be boards and beyond. It can be, used, it can be Anki. It can be whatever works for you. It can be textbooks. I literally sat down and read Robin's cover to cover my repeat year. And I was just a book person. So it does not matter what resource you use, but do not overload yourself with resources because it gets overwhelming to try to get through absolutely everything. Make a couple of things that you're like, I'm just going to do these hundred percent, make one of them you world, especially for step one and just, you know, focus on that. Not for sure. All right. So that sort of caps off the submitted questions there. And then our next questions that were submitted were around rotations. Um, so I kind of uh, consolidated a number of different questions, uh, but how to get the most out of clinical rotations. Um, a lot of questions about time management, um, especially as you start getting into clinicals. Um, and then there were also a number of questions about electives, audition electives, the timing of doing electives, things like that. So any strong feelings anyone want to start on there? can start since I did MS3 very recently. Um, so I, there's, I think, particular points to this that I can speak to better than others, which was maximizing my study time. Um, so every school is like a little different, but my school went through a huge transition with COVID where we did not get any dedicated time to study for our shelf exams. And I know a lot of schools out there don't do that to begin with, but we transitioned from having a week um, that you were totally off to study for your shelf prior to your shelf to having 
no time. And that was a really big transition for, I think, everyone that was coming into rotations because we literally had to do rotations and then study at the same time. So I think one thing that's kind of underutilized is use your downtime at work, like definitely do what you're supposed to do and fulfill your clinical duties. But I remember I was on nights for pediatrics and it was dead and the residents and the other med students were like playing that awesome, awkward Yeti, um, like card game. That's like super fun. And I would like go in and play one round and then I'd go back and I'd be studying because that was, you know, 12 hours that was, unless I like had something to do or a patient to see or a patient to be following up with, like that was time that I needed to be studying. Um, so I think really using your downtime on rotations and having realistic expectations with yourself. Like if you are on labor and delivery and working 12 hours, you're not going to want to come home and study. If you have clinic, that is going to be the time that you might have a couple hours in the evening to study. I'm a person that needs to take a nap, <laughs> especially after a long day. So I would like come home, take like an hour or two to myself. And then beyond that, like I would have my three, four hours a night where I was like, this is my study time. I have to get it done because there's no other time to do it. I think a lot of people focus on weekends or kind of cramming it. And I think it's very manageable to do it if you use your downtime and use your time efficiently. Um, in terms of getting the most out of your clinical rotations, I absolutely loved MS3 year compared to preclinicals just because you're actually doing all the things you came to medical school to do. You know, like that's the first time that you get to see patients. The resident will be like, hey, go see this patient and then tell me what you think. Like that was so cool to me because it was the first time that I was actually like doing doctor stuff. And I think soaking up the fact that this might be the only time that you get to do a lot of things. And that was the coolest part to me about MS3 year. Like I'm going into family medicine during surgery. Like that was probably one of the only times that I'm like really going to be in an OR during, um, psychiatry, being able to do a mental status exam. And the other way that I think you can get a lot out of clinical rotations is really taking the time to think about what you're learning out of the textbook or out of whatever resource you're using, and then using that to ask questions about actual cases you're seeing. I think just kind of the kind of the way that sketchy works with, you know, visual learning, that's the same way that clinical rotations kind of were for me. It wasn't just, I'm reading about this disease. It's now I'm seeing this disease and I get to ask questions about it and understand it better. So uh, just um, some other things that, that I would like to add as well. Um, when you start out your clinical rotations, it's, it's so important to be highly organized because now you're shifting focus from your you know, school life to studying all the time, to doing questions at home, to having to go into work, which is very different. Um, but you have to do both. So the question is, how do you do both very well? And I think um, some good advice would be to uh, make a list uh, each week of, of your goals that week, what systems you want to conquer. Um, you know, again, if you're in your internal medicine rotation, um, no, usually it's about 12 weeks. So figuring out how to go about each system so that at the end of that week, you have covered what you need to cover for your shelf exam. Um, doing well on your shelf exam is, is really important to, to taking, um, going to the next level. So I think, Using UWorld again is really important uh, to do well. Uh, using Sketchy is really important. Um, but I think staying highly organized is, is something that got me through um, the clinical rotations. And, and again, you're so busy on surgical rotations and, and OB-GYN rotations that you're really not going to have the energy to go home and to do those, those extra things. So if you can set a, a time aside, um, already previously, like in the beginning of that week and make sure you get that done. It makes things, um, you know, better, um, that, you know, most likely you'll be able to do it. Yeah. I would just chime in. Um, you can set expectations with your residents. Um, you know, they're your friend and ally in, in your rotation. So, um, we often look at, so like, for instance, I have a, you know, med student that's, not just in general surgery, but when it's in ortho, 
and I can send them on ortho cases or, or something that's in particular. But I would not know that if they didn't accept the expectation and, and use that side of the, um, you show motivation as well. So just set clear expectations and say, you know, I want to learn you know, all of it, but I'm interested in this. And, and um, you know, if you show up uh, on time and, and, you know, dedicated every day, um, we see that. That's really, really good point. And, you know, the residents are there to help you and they want you to learn. They want you to succeed for sure. Um, so a number of questions came in on how to best stand out as a residency applicant. Um, a lot of application tip questions. And um, there was even another question that just came into the chat about um, a non-traditional or IMG applicant as well. So we can definitely address some of those questions. Um, I guess, Alessandra, I know you just went through fellowship match as well. What was that like for you? So I hate to say it, but there's really no difference between fellowship match preparation and residency match preparation. It's really the same. And if you get good at preparing, then you'll be able to match into the specialty of your, cho of your choice. Um, so some of the things that programs are looking for are, you know, most importantly, um, you know, on your application, they look at your test scores, of course, step one. Um, and step two are very important. Back when I took step one, it was not pass fail. So what they looked at was if there was improvement from step one to step two or not. Um, so given the fact that step one is now pass fail, I think that's something that, you know, you just have to worry about passing that one exam. Um, so that you don't have to worry about really as much. Um, but getting, um, getting your foot in the door in medical school is really important. So making connections with, um, you know, attendings or mentors, people who can help you succeed. When I was a medical student, I um, knew I wanted to go into oncology. So I made a lot of relationships around the hospital with um, the oncology department, specifically in the lymphoma department. And I um, wrote up a few cases. I published my first case report and I presented the case during um, grand rounds at the end of my third year of medical school medical school. And I was able to ask for a letter of recommendation um, for residency. And I, I became very close with the program director. She helped me um, with the grand rounds. And I think having a goal set in mind as to um, what it is that you want to go into, like, what is, what is it that you're applying for? Um, and if it's internal medicine or surgery, what are those steps you have to do to get to that? So for I am, it's very research heavy. Um, for emergency medicine, it's not. So my husband, he had applied for emergency medicine, also an international medical graduate. We had done the couples match, um, which was also um, very difficult because we wanted to be in the same area. And EM is um, much more competitive than I am for IMGs. So um, for him, he really didn't need any, um, any research. It was more about his um, sub internships that he had, which are really, really important. So if you want to go into EM or things like surgery, um, getting to know that program, the program director, the residents there, and making your name known, I think is really important so that when your name comes up in the application, they see it, they remember you, and they connect a good, um, a good memory to that. Um, and I think, you know, aside from that, uh, you know, tips for IMG candidates. So, you know, just to talk a little bit about that, I think, um, again, you know, unfortunately we're at a disadvantage because there are so many of us and we have to travel out of our country to, um, to get the education that we need to succeed. But I think if you are dedicated and you can show that on your CV and you can talk about it at the interview, once you get to that interview, show that you're a person, show that you're, um, you know, you're confident that you have passion in whatever field that you're interviewing for. And I think really what's most important is, is making that connection with the program, being able to answer why it is that you want to go to that specific program. Um, why it is that you want to live there? What are your future goals? Um, these are some of the questions they're going to ask you and being able to be confident and prepared for them is, is so important um, when it comes up to that day. Very cool. And I guess to follow that, um, you 
sort of mentioned the couples matching and, you know, both of you coming in, uh, did that change things for you as far as the number of programs that you applied to, um, the geographical location? Uh, can you speak a little bit to how yeah. you made your list? Absolutely. So we um, we applied very broadly because, again, coming from IMG, we did not know how many interviews you would need. And we were told we needed at least 10. 10 is the magic number. So if we need 10, then we need at least 10 places that are near each other, too, because we want to be able to make every permutation possible to give ourselves the best um, opportunity to be close to each other. So we had um, applied for, I think, can't remember exactly how, I think about 260 programs I applied to. So I over applied and it's very expensive. So I applied to way too many programs, um, which I also don't advise doing because you will find that, you know, once you start getting interviews, a lot of these programs you might not be interested in. So I think applying to places where you see yourself working. So for instance, I don't see myself working in Brooklyn or in Queens or a place that's very highly congested, but um, so for fellowship, I didn't even apply there because I knew that I could not succeed in a place where um, I didn't feel comfortable in. So I think narrowing down where you see yourself practicing is key. Now, the two of us at that time, we were we did not know what to expect. So we applied everywhere and I ended up getting about 26 interviews. He got about um, around 30. He dropped a few and I dropped a few. And then he applied for IM and EM. And he had 10 um, EM interviews and the rest were IM interviews. So we started narrowing things down and we started making a graph of like where everything was located so that we knew we could be close to each other. For instance, if I, uh, I got an interview in New Jersey and he got you know two interviews in New Jersey, um, that's several different options that we can do for each other, uh, like you know make for each other so that we're giving ourselves the best chance. Um, at the end, we ended up uh, making a list of, I think, um, 200 different like options, and we ended up matching at our number four, which um, he's over at Newark Beth Israel doing um, emergency medicine, graduating, also going into fellowship. And, um, you know, I ended up matching internal medicine over at Hackensack University Medical Center. So I think if you can find so just to sum things up, find a location that you both would like to practice at, multiple locations, um, and then try to get as many interviews in that location as you can and vouch for each other. So once you get an interview, if your significant other did not, talk to that program. They're very, very receptive. They're very easy to talk to. Tell them that your significant other also applied for this program at their hospital, can you talk to the other program director about getting them that interview? You'd be surprised at how many interviews you can get that way. And, and the two of us got a, a whole, maybe at least five or six interviews doing that. Um, they want people to go there. They want people to succeed. And if they really like you, they will find a way to make it work. So um, just put yourself out there and you can't really lose anything from doing that. Those are all really, really solid tips. Um, one thing I, I did want to follow up on is that if you are going to parallel path and apply to two different fields, totally fine. Make sure you don't do them at the same place um, because if you're interviewing for one specialty and then you run into the other specialty that you also apply to on your interview day, it, it's really awkward. So don't do that. Um, but other than that, um, parallel path is acceptable. Um, just got to be smart about it. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I guess I wanted to ask Austin because you had sort of talked to briefly some um, interview day stuff about talking to candidates. Do you have any specific advice for uh, people that might be interviewing? Oh, I don't know. Austin uh, maybe dropped off with a two year old situation. I guess I uh, will. Throw that over nope, to I'm you. here. He's back. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, no, so speaking to the IMG or FMGs and candidates, um, we actually have quite a bit on our program, our surgery program, and they're excellent. Um, I would reach out to your alumni members. Um, so we have a couple of pathways that, you know, we have schools that send excellent candidates and we interview from those schools that, you know, traditionally wouldn't have interviews uh, at other programs. Um, and uh, I guess just be yourself for the interviews, um, you know, have an excellent candidate, uh, you know, appearance and um, 
well in, in that sense that uh just be be yourself and be polished be comfortable um and that really shows So I'm not sure if interviews are virtual still for you guys, but for me, it was for fellowship. And, and really what helped me just to add one more thing is putting post-its around my computer so that when they ask me a question about something, I automatically reflexed to that comment on a post on a post-it. And I knew exactly what to say or, um, you know, recent research works that you read, just writing down the data from it on your computer so that you can just quickly refer to something and um, you don't have to spend that time thinking about, you know, how to answer the question. And there was a question that just came into the chat that, um, Lavina, do you mind kind of commenting on is sort of some do's and don'ts with personal essays um, and specific example of repeating a year, um, which, you know, how did you manage that in your essay and your application? Obviously it worked out well for you. So what was your strategy? Yeah, so I feel really passionate about this topic because like Alessandra going into this match, I over applied as well. I over applied, I applied family medicine. I applied only family medicine into 120 programs. And generally for family medicine, if you're a USMD, um, that, that is beyond overkill. Um, so I, I had a couple of red flags on my app. First of all, not only did I have a repeat year, I also had a pretty low step one score because I also took it with a score. So going into the match, I was like, I am just going to be really happy to match. <laughs> um, and so I think, first of all, just to address the question, I personally did not want to be defined by that one part of my experience. And um, it was the best decision of my life to repeat a year. And it was brought up in some interviews, not all, um, but I did not address it in my personal statement. It was something that was, I know, clear on my Dean's letter, my scores were apparent, like it was all there. So there was really nothing that I felt I needed to say about it that you know, catered to why I wanted to be a family medicine doctor. And for that reason, I did not mention it in my personal statement. Um, I know from talking to residency directors, they do like for it to be addressed somewhere on your application. So I would definitely make sure that you talk to your dean about how it looks in your dean's letter um, from your medical school and what I guess they are portraying because I also self-decided to repeat a year. Like I had multiple issues that had happened during the year and I was given a couple of options. So I was able to portray it kind of being like, I made the decision to repeat a year in order to gain more medical knowledge. Um, that being said, I'm really passionate about this topic because I feel like I had a really great experience applying to residency in contrast to what my scores said about me. I did have a big jump from step one to step two um, almost, you know, like 10, 20% increase. Um, and I do believe that did help. I was not applying to an extremely competitive specialty. Um, and I applied to a specialty that really does care about the holistic applicant. Um, so that being said, I know, I, I really think that LORs are extremely important. Um, I think having people that can speak to different parts of your character and your, medical ability. I had a letter of recommendation about my passion for working with socioeconomically diverse backgrounds. I had a letter of rec on um, being able to like improve myself in terms of developing differential diagnosis. And then I had a letter of rec speaking to my empathy on clinical rotations. And those were all from family medicine physicians because that's who I felt most comfortable with. Um, that also being said, I think one really underrated part of this process is networking. So I am not from a medical background. My parents are not doctors. Um, I'm not from Texas, even though I attend school here. And I think that the amount of networking I did, and I'll give examples in a second, really, really, really helped me match where I did. So for example, um, the American Academy of Family Physicians, the AA has an annual conference where they have a residency fair and that's something that is recommended to go to but when I was applying to residency I was really interested 
in going to the Chicago area. Um, and historically, like a lot of students from my school end up matching in Texas. We don't have a lot of students that leave Texas. So I did a lot of networking where I went to like a Midwest um, family physicians residency fair. I went to and emailed all the people I met with at that and, you know, said that, you know, I, I was really interested in their program. And then beyond that, I also wrote personalized personal statements for different parts of the country I was interested in. So I wrote a personal statement for Chicago, I wrote a personal statement for Houston, and then I had like a general personal statement. I think that really, really helped me because I actually interviewed at five programs in Chicago, which is not super common for people from my school to be able to get that many out of state interviews. Um, I also sent out about 50 letters of interest. So I was sitting down on my sub eye one night. And I just went through all of my like top programs and programs that I was just interested in general, wrote them a general email saying, hey, I'm super interested in your program because of X, Y, Z reason. And that probably got me about half the interviews I got. I got about 22 interviews out of 120 programs. And I would say about at least 10 to 12 of those were from those emails, um, including the program that I matched at, which I was like stoked to match at. Um, I think, in general, one thing that I was kind of surprised by going through the residency process is how much etiquette is ignored. So don't forget to send your thank you letters. Like, don't forget to, you know, uh, like just be nice to the people that you're talking to. I was really surprised by the amount of candidates um, in my class who like weren't sending thank you letters and that sort of thing. And even if I wasn't interested in the program, I sent a thank you letter um, and followed up with them. In terms of interview tips, um, I think what Austin and, and Alessandra have said is like 100% real, like just be yourself. There's nothing to be nervous about. You don't wanna be at a program that doesn't love you or want you for who you are. Um, one other thing I wanna mention that I, I had on my application. So I didn't have a ton of research. I had about one case study and a publication pending. So two first authors. Um, but beyond that, I'm very passionate about mentorship of pre-meds and increasing um, diversity in medicine. And that was kind of a theme throughout my application that showed through my extracurriculars. So I run a cohort for pre-meds. I volunteer through an organization. I do some paid work. And that was pretty much like my primary extracurricular. And it kind of represented what I said in my personal statement and also carried through on the interview, which I think is how I ended up at the program I ended up with, which was actually my top choice. And I was very excited to be able to match there um, because of their focus on social justice, um, their focus on you know working with the community and outreach in the community. So what you put out there is much more important than what they're looking for because you wanna end up at a program that matches what you're looking for. You wanna end up at a program that helps you get to your goals. So. I wanted a program that was very focused on community service, working with the community, um, underserved populations, that sort of thing, and also a heavy outpatient focus for family medicine. And that's exactly the program I ended up with because I felt like I was really authentic in my application. These are all phenomenal, phenomenal tips. Um, there was a question in the chat asking you, when did you send those letters of interest? In the yeah, great question. Um, so there's like a general panic after ERAS is submitted for like a week where people are like, where are my interviews? Um, and I, I actually was lucky enough to get a couple interviews that first week that kind of calmed me down. But I think after ERAS was submitted on like September 29th and I was still waiting on quite a few interviews around like end of October, beginning of November. So that's when I started sending letters of interest. Um, yeah. Cool. Thank you. And there, there's one other question here that I was going to take um, asking for LOR. Um, and my advice is um, to just be really upfront with it. Um, I worked in uh, academic anesthesiology for a long time as fellowship director, and I had a lot of respect for students that would come in and, you know, meet with me as clerkship director the first day and say like, yeah, I'm going to be looking for an LOR from this um, rotation. What's, you know, some great attendings for me to, to work with, you know, tell me more about the, the structure and, you know, those students that would take the initiative to come to our didactic sessions, to come to our early morning meetings, um, it shows. And um, 
those are the students that had really um, personal LORs because we, we knew them, we knew their character, we could give actual examples. Um, but you don't want to sort of the crappy, like, yeah, they're a good student, or yeah, they try hard or whatever, or just a recap of the CV. You want someone who's going to be able to give examples of saying, yeah, this person's a real team player. There was a time they stayed late to help because there was a, a an issue with the patient, or you know, who really can who really knows you and can can write that really solid LOR. And I think it's it's okay to ask, you know, are you comfortable writing me um, a very solid or uh, whatever phrase you want to use, but it's okay to ask that and give them the option to back out. Um, I've had students who've asked me, you know, can I, are you, can you write me a, a letter? And I've had to say to them, you know, I'm sorry, we just really haven't worked together very much, worked together once. I, I don't think it's going to be the best letter for you. Um, a uh, question about LOR from rotations versus other experiences in medical school, community service or certificate tracks. Um, I would, lean more heavily towards rotations. Um, if you want to do like a community service track or something, um, that would be sort of the extra letter. Um, so if you're gonna, if you're, I would have like maybe three from rotations and then maybe your fourth or whatever extra um, because they're, these people that are taking you into their residency wanna know how you're gonna perform as a resident and rotations are gonna be the best example of that. Um, yeah, I'd also say, yeah, definitely echo. Um, so you can feel confident or say, like, um, ask the uh, letter writer if they can write you a strong letter. There's nothing worse than seeing an applicant that, you know, it's just a blanket letter. Um, and it shows that, you know, one, they didn't really um, choose the best letter writer, and then um, I feel bad for them. Um, secondly, uh, if you have a like a letter, like a research mentor that really is passionate, you've done a lot of clinical work or, or bench research or anything like that, you can have them as a compliment of the letter. Um, one of my, I didn't go into ophthalmology, but one of my uh, ophthalmology research mentors um, I had worked with, they wrote me one of the strongest letter recommendation and that, would, that helped me with general surgery too. So as long as it, you can, um, as long as it's really a strong letter and uh, personable and you know it shows your your um, characteristics i would say um, go ahead there was one other question in the chat specific to alessandra um franco uh got disconnected so we just wanted to find out if we answered um for the your lor did you use the u.s one or foreign one i'm sorry what what was the question um, he's asking if there is a, if you used U.S. letters or foreign letters. So um, I used all my letters for residency came from my clinical rotation. So they were all from U.S. Um, attendings and mentors. Sounds good. Um, the last overall bucket category that people were writing in with questions was a lot of questions about work-life balance and selecting a specialty and knowing that you're the right fit for it, um, selecting a residency program, day-to-day -day life, uh, questions like that. And I know we were chatting ahead of time that Alessandro is like, well, that's my day-to-day -day existence. So do you wanna chat a little bit about that? Yeah, so your day-to-day -day life as a resident really depends on number one, what year you are, what rotation you're on and what specialty you're in, because that's all gonna change your day-to-day -day life. Um, but I can answer for what my day-to-day -day life usually looks like as um, a PGY-3 um, in internal medicine. So it, again, it's going to depend on whether you're in critical care rotation or your floors. Um, we have step-down unit as well and night float. So those are gonna be your core rotations. And of course, outpatient, you can't forget about the 30% of outpatient you need to graduate. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the main things I'm going to focus on are the floors and the ICU, because that is really where all of your medicine rotations are done, the majority. So on your floor rotations, um, you get to the hospital very early around 6.45, 7 a.m. Um, as a PGY3, you are in charge of the team. So you're in charge of medical students, um, res you know, residents, interns, and you uh, essentially report to your attending and um, you're in charge of all the patients at the end of the day, because um, 
you know, you're, you're overseeing everybody and your interns, your medical students, everyone's going to come to you for questions and confirmation on orders and, and things like that. So um, it's really exciting to be in this position because you've worked so many years in medical school and residency to finally be right um, underneath the attending and be able to make decisions um, with your team um, and, and see how those decisions affect your patients' lives. Um, you know, uh, at, at 7 a.m., after you meet with your team, you run the list, you go see your patients, um, and then you round. And in internal medicine, rounding is a big deal, whereas in other specialties, and I'm sure Austin could say in surgery or in emergency medicine, not so much. Um, so the rounding is really what takes up the majority of the day in your ICU and floor rotations. And then after you do many, many hours of rounding, you have your conferences and then you put all your orders in, you write notes. A lot of medicine is shifting to like less patient care uh, or less direct patient care and more, more notes, which is very frustrating. You're on your computer screens a lot during the day, which is um, something that no one really tells you in your first and second year of medical school that you're spending so much time sitting and typing notes and calling, making phone calls to consults, making phone calls to family members. Um, so there's a lot of, um, at first, like when you start internal medicine, you may think you're a glorified secretary, um, but there, there's a lot of learning and the curve is extremely steep. So um, it will take you, that's why residency is three years, it will take you three years to feel comfortable doing what you're doing. So when you start off residency as an intern, um, know that you really don't know anything. So you have to, I mean, you know your medical knowledge, but you really don't know enough to, um, you know, to, to feel comfortable with what you know. And there's always going to be people who know more than you, even as a PGY3 and as an attending practicing for many years, I'm sure you're never going to feel confident and comfortable enough, but that's why that's what keeps you motivated. That's what keeps you going back home, reading more learning about your patients. Um, and I think other things that keep you motivated is just remembering to be a human. Don't forget about those hobbies, those things that make you who you are. Um, for me, it's painting, it's kickboxing, it's working out, it's walking my dog. Um, you know, it's, it's a very stressful, um, it's a very stressful profession to be in as a resident. You're not making as much money. Um, you have a lot of things to pay for. And on top of it, you have a pandemic added on, on, onto all of that. Um, and, and some of you have life events happening, whether it be kids or getting married, you know, I got married during residency. So it was, it was a lot of, of life happening around you and finding ways to balance that is key because you don't want to forget who you are. Um, so coming home and, and doing that one thing that reminds you of who you are, whether it be any of those, those hobbies you have. So I think that's important. And I guess Lavina or Austin, any other comments on what led you down a particular path towards uh, a particular specialty? I know um, I've heard people kind of describe like med medical medicine versus surgical, procedural versus um, cognitive, and you know there's many different divisions that you can take that path. Yeah, I would say so. Um, just I think use your third year of medical school. Um, your clinical rotations just to throw yourself into every topic. Um, you may have some gravitation towards one, but like I think another panelist said, and, you know, you're only going to experience that type of medicine like this part of the first time ever and only time ever. Um, so you'll really develop that feel and, and see what you want to do. Um, and I think it's kind of crude, but one of my mentors told me, you know, pick what you, you hate the least. Um, so there's, there's going to be tough days. Um, but if your tough days are still your good days, that that feels going to be good for you um speaking of work-life balance um so i'm a father uh my wife's at home with my uh, newborn son and i have a two-year-old toddler right now uh, at the park um surgery is busy uh we go in from six air the workday starts at like 5 50 a.m to about 6 30 p.m so usually 12 to 13 hours a day um your morning is to yourself really um but then for me my family time is my afternoon or my, uh, you know, after work. Um, but you just kind of carve it out. Um, and early to different specialties is, uh, you know, different specialties are, I have a best friend who's in internal medicine and, and his ICU days can be as long as in my, my surgery days. Um, so it's just, you have everything, um, you know, all, every specialty has their, has their work-life balance and, you know, uh, things can get hard and easy at the same time.
Fantastic. Um, I really appreciate all of the insight here. Um, I'm just reading through some of the questions. Uh, there was a question about Sketchy Neuro um, that is going to be launching in the next couple months, and it will be uh, for step two. It's going to be part of our clinical portfolio. Um, uh, pretty specific um, questions I'm trying to answer in the chat. Um, I guess this would be sort of a good time to go forward with um, kind of our wrap up. I did want to bring it back to Sketchy and make sure that you all saw we have a promo code for you tonight, 10% off with our resident 10 promo code. And I guess just to finish it off for our panelists, um, you know, can you relate back to how did Sketchy impact your journey? Um, how did it help you? Absolutely. So um, Sketchy has, so I've been watching Sketchy since I was a um, first year of medical school, which at that time Sketchy had um, only micro and I think farm. So this was back in 2015. And um, during my education, I've, as, as um, my curriculum, you know, progressed throughout the years, so did Sketchy. And it's been such an incredible resource to have um, and to utilize in times where, you know, I'm not learning anything from lecture style and I need that visual, um, you know, orientation to gather information and remember information from. And so Sketchy really um, nails all of that. It's something you don't have to keep um, using over and over again, you watch a video or two and you just remember it. You remember the symbols and you're able to answer that question and really relate back to that sketchy video. And that doesn't go away. Even today, um, you know, practicing medicine, I talk to my students and residents all the time about um, sketchy and how, you know, we'll be talking about a patient's medication. And I'll say, well, in sketchy, this was, they mentioned this as a side effect. So look, our patient also has that. And it's probably related to the, the medication. Um, and so you're constantly, constantly um, going back to those videos. So I think it's, it's just been such an incredible, um, you know, it's an incredible resource to have. Yeah, I, I, I kind of grew up on Sketchy Farm and Sketchy Micro, and I did really well in the Sketch, uh, in my microbiology courses and did, you know, phenomenal in step one from those sections. Um, not so much others because I didn't have Sketchy, the other topics, but um, no, it, I referenced my Sketchy knowledge, you know, you know daily. There was the poignant gangrene, and we had, you know, why did you add clindamycin and for the toxins and stuff like that? So I just, you know, uh, the knowledge sticks with you. I don't think I have anything to say that hasn't already been said because I echo all of that. Also grew up on Sketchy Farm, Sketchy Micro. Um, but I'll add a fun note and say that Sketchy is so widely used at my school that we have a Sketchy party at the end of our first year for all the students to dress up as their favorite Sketchy character. So, yeah. Fantastic. And there was another question in the chat asking, um, uh, to elaborate a little bit more on the clinical 2.0 and that is currently launching. We have a number of lessons already out and a whole bunch more coming out in two weeks for May. Um, what we're doing is we asked our students what your needs are and our students spoke and they answered. Um, so there are, our students are asking for shorter videos really targeted to the MS3 needs. Um, and now that we have our combined subscription, our students have access to both the preclinical as well as the clinical content. So we don't necessarily have to revisit all of the pathophys that you already got from Sketchy preclinical um, and Sketchy Path and all those other courses. So this way we're really able to target down on the clinical presentation, the workup, the management and the plan. And we're making them a lot shorter so that way they can continue to fit into those niches in the day. Um, that our students do have to study in the clinical environment because we know that you don't have hours to be at home uh, watching sketchy videos. So we're really um, trying to shorten them to make them um, a lot easier to fit into your schedule. 
Um, there was another question about when does the coupon code expire and it is May 20th.